Welcome to our next module on protein byproduct feeds. Protein byproduct feeds have had lots of activity recently because of some banning of certain products, uh, cost variation as protein supplements and soybean meal change. Certainly the strategies of how, when, and where to use these products will also change. Perhaps uh, the most important question to ask is if I'm going to buy a, a protein supplement, either an animal protein or a grain protein product that has a bypass protein characteristic, and that will be the thrust of this module, certainly we need to ask these questions if it's going to be successfully placed in the feeding program. Number one, it must be of a high quality, high quality in terms of amino acid, in terms of digestibility, in terms of bypass, and level of protein. So it's got to meet all those criteria to be a quote-unquote a good one. Number Number two, it must not depress feed intake. And many of the animal proteins, marine proteins, can have cows backing off on feed intake. Anytime we do that, that's a loser. We must also not affect the rumen dynamics, either in terms of degradability of the organic matter, which stands for the OM, or affect the microbial protein synthesis because they're the cheapest sources and they are the highest quality protein for the dairy cow or the beef cow. Uh, thirdly, it must complement, that is, the amino acid profile of the protein source, what is going to the amino acid from the microbes and other feed sources. So if you're feeding corn silage, which is low in lysine, then you're looking at an, a bypass product that would bring lysine to the party to complement the corn silage. And of course, in all cases, it must be a very economical source so we keep our feed costs at an optimal level. We will now walk through a series of these selected protein supplements and just kind of profile them and talk about them very briefly and then summarize how to position them and how it levels to feed. The first one will be blood meal, the very black type feed product. It is extremely high in protein, as you can see, at 87%. These are all expressed on a dry matter pace with a bypass or rumen undegradable protein value of over 80%. This is uh, the superstar in terms of having extremely high numbers in both categories. It is very high in undegradable lysine, which makes it very popular in corn-based feeding programs. It has a serious palatability problem. Many farmers argue that once you get over a half a pound, you might start seeing this effect occurring. Fourthly, you must talk to your processor to make sure that it has not been damaged during the drying process. Very little of that poor quality blood meal appears in the U.S. anymore, but certainly is a question to ask. The next byproduct feed will be meat and bone meal. Again, a very popular product, but it carries some new history with it. You can see it is slightly lower in protein at 54%. It has a very nice bypass value with it, but it carries some other neat things. 14% fat, 12% calcium, 6% phosphorus. So it brings a lot more value to the party when you put it in the feeding program, and you must adjust the ration for these values so you don't waste the nutrients. It is extremely variable both in quality and nutrient content. Illinois has done some very neat work sampling 50 samples from across Canada the United States and meat and bone meal is not meat and bone meal is not meat and bone meal so be very sure you know what your supplier is giving to you on this one thirdly is a critical point and that is that only non-ruminant meat and bone meal can be fed to dairy cattle this relates back to the problem of the spongy brain disease or the BSE disease therefore you must be feeding to your animals if you're feeding it either a swine or poultry source and suppliers will know this so certainly you have to be very careful with this because you are responsible from FDA to feed only the proper types to minimize that potential risk. Palatability is always a problem with meat and bone meal. Some of it downright stinks, and so you've got to be sure you have positioned it properly. The good news is that it's a very economical source of both of nutrients when you look at the whole package together. In many cases, it is almost half the value of the other nutrients, so it is very popular with feed companies and with dairy farmers. Our next product is fish meal, also known as marine protein. The profile, again, is very favorable. You can see it is somewhat similar to meat and bone meal in that it also carries with it a nice source of energy from fish oil in this case and a slightly lower but significant amounts of calcium and phosphorus. In fact, if you look at fish meal, you can actually see the bones because that is exactly what's in fish meal. It is about everything you and I do not eat. And so uh, all that is there, including the bones itself that is ground up. Palatability is another problem because it has a very distinctive sharp odor associated with it, especially depending on how it's, how it's handled. It too can be variable and bypass characteristic depending on uh, how much degradation occurs before the drying process. Obviously, uh, the meat part, if you wish, of, or the fillet part of the fish is very valuable, and sometimes the other material can uh, remain around for days, which really, really lowers value. The good news is it's a very good source of undegradable protein, the rumen bypass protein in the model, and it has a good source of lysine, so it, it brings a nice balance. If you look at some of the, the bypass protein supplements, this 
may be after Rune Micros may be the next winner because it has a very nice level and balance of those key first limiting amino acids. One of the problems is fish oil. It is really tough on the rumen microbes if it's very unsaturated. It is very unsaturated and it can really affect rumen fiber uh, digestibility and rumen VFA patterns. So therefore, fish meals can vary in oil content. If you're a nutritionist out there, this is something you may want to look at when you're purchasing fish meals. Become, some can be as low as 3 or 4%. Some can be as high as 12 to 14% oil. The guideline is about 50 or 60 grams of fish oil is about the maximum level to avoid that problem we listed there. And as we indicated earlier, quality can vary greatly. And that may be as much, if anything, as source dependent. Uh, different types of sources like Manhaden would be different than some of the white fishes. And of course, how it's handled. A very popular product in Illinois in the Midwest with corn distillers grain. Again, the nutrient profile, you can see the protein and the bypass is going down slightly, but still it has a very nice profile for us. The oil content can vary greatly depending on the process. Obviously, corn oil is corn oil, but some processes can remove that corn oil. So you can see it varying all the way from 1 or 2%, all the way up to 10 or 12%, and obviously the high oil one has more value and improves palatability, reduces dustiness. It's a very good source of phosphorus, Make sure you calculate that in, and it will vary from plant to plant. We did not list calcium because corn is quite low in calcium. The good news here, this is a very palatable feed. Cows relish it. In fact, the Amish people, they will use a corn distiller soy type mixture as kind of their mix because in many cases they are top dressing it, and cows will really uh, relish that. It is very good buy depending on the marketplace here in Illinois, but it can be extremely economical. So this is one you always want to look at along with meat and bone meal as being good buys out there in the program. One thing to be very cautious about is heat damage problems. If this product becomes uh, coffee-like looking, a very dark brown to black, then there has been some heat damage. Good corn distiller's grain will be a light brown, almost to a tanned color. Uh, some of you are used to corn and gluten feed, uh, these should look much the same. So certainly watch out for this heat damage because you will lose both the digestibility and will destroy some of the key amino acids lysine in this process. Brewer's grain is less common in certain parts of the Midwest of the United States, depending on where the brewery is and how they are processing the grain. Again, the protein content can vary, and that depends on how much barley, how much rice, and other grains they have in that uh, making of the brewed grain. Of course, that's what gives beer its different flavors. It has a fairly good bypass characteristic, around 47%. It does have some oil in it and a nice source of phosphorus. So again, it brings things to the party. Brewer's grain is very palatable when it is wet, in fact, we call it poor man's corn silage or rich man's, depending on how you interpret that statement, and especially when it's fresh. The dried brewer's grain is very dusty, very difficult to handle, and many farmers don't want to mess with the dry product because of its handling characteristics and, and just, just the, the mess that it involves. Usually it's a very good uh, buy depending on the wet basis, if usually within 100 miles of the source of the brewery. So certainly if you're near St. Louis or near Milwaukee or near, near La Crosse, for example, those can be very economical buys because when you're going much more outside of that, you're carrying too much water. You've got to be very careful when pricing this because some of the brewers Brewer's grain is pressed, which they mean they remove another 10% out. So the brewer's grain can be anywhere from 20% dry matter to 30% dry matter and has a dramatic effect on what that feed is worth. So make sure you are aware of what your dry matters are and pencil accordingly. Moldy wet brew is a very dangerous feed. Uh, generally speaking, we like to see it fed up in a three to four day period in the summer and seven to ten days in the winter if you do not have it bagged. And that's the last bullet. Wet brewers can be bagged, which is a very nice sealing process. I know farmers here in the Midwest, they will get distressed brewer's grain because of dryers going down. They will bag it and hold it for as much as six months and have very good success with it. And in the summer, we highly recommend to put the brewer's grain in the bag. That keeps the flies, that keeps the degradation, that keeps the air away from it and we can avoid that other point. So brewer's grain needs to be managed and priced properly. Dried brewers is very difficult to buy because most of that is locked up by some of the big commodity brokers and in many cases it leaves the country and goes to Pacific Rim. Our last protein product we will talk about will be soybeans. Soybeans really isn't a byproduct feed, but certainly it is an excellent source of protein for the dairy animal. The protein content of the soybean can be up in that 40% protein range. However, how we handle it in terms of heat treatment really changes the dynamics of the undegradable fraction. As you can see on the visual here, the raw soybean is very low in degradable protein, only about 20%. Soybeans are a good source of oil in that 90% range and a good source of phosphorus as well. 
if we effectively heat treat the soybean, we can raise the rumen undegradable protein all the way up to 40 to 60 percent. Some of the treated soybean meals can even be as high as 70 percent if you're using some of the new chemically treated type products. So there's lots of things we can do to soybeans and soybean meal to change its dynamics. If we are going to effectively heat treat the soybean, the University of Wisconsin suggests we need to get the temperature up in that 290 degree Fahrenheit range. And this is important, especially with our roasters, because that will vary depending on the type of processor, the speed that the beans are going through, and also the moisture of the soybean going in. Once it exits the temperature, we like to steep it, which means we hold the temperature. We do not let it cool off for about 30 to 45 minutes. This continues the cooking process to give us the denaturization. It's like a little bit like cooking an egg, but not frying it real hard. So you're trying to, to very modestly adjust the solubility and degradability of the protein. There is a test available that's uh, being featured by several labs, primarily in Wisconsin, called the PDI, stands for the Protein Dispersibility Index, and they will actually test the solubility. And if that solubility is in that 9 to 11 percent range, that is optimal. If it's less than 9, you should have them also run a second test they can to determine if it's heat damaged or overheated. If it's at 11 to 14 percent, then you're in that marginal range. As we talked earlier, something in the heating process probably just didn't allow us to achieve the temperatures and steeping temperatures we were striving for. By the way, the steeping temperature probably is in the range of about 250, 270 degrees. Most people don't measure that, but that's about what that mass will hold as you move it into the holding area. If it's over 14 on the PDI index, then it's going to be underheated and it will behave much like the raw soybean in terms of protein dynamics. However, a underheated product will still get rid of the, the trypsin inhibitors in the ureases, which are so critical to pigs and chickens. Another characteristic is look at the color of it and taste it. It should be kind of a brownish type color to the bean and it should taste like a peanut. If it's real chewy and soft, then that's another evidence that we didn't get the temperatures up to where we want them to be. Our next slide is then says, well, what does the research look like? This is some work pulled together by the Works of Arizona. And they went through the Journal of Dairy Science and Animal Sciences and looked at all the research on these products with lactating dairy cattle. And they looked at three characteristics. They looked at milk yield, they looked at protein test, and they looked at fat test. Next, you can see a series of minuses, zeros, and pluses. And at the bottom of the screen, it quickly tells you that a minus means that actually when you replace this product in the diet, it decreased, let's use milk eel, for example, the milk production in that study and means that something, remember we said earlier, it must not mess up the rumen. In some cases, this may have been the problem or one of those other characteristics are missing. A zero means that there was no response. In other words, we did increase milk yield, we didn't drop it. It would just stay no significant difference. And of course, a positive, that's what all of us would like to see, means that we did get a response in milk yield. So let's take a look at the treated soybean meal. Now this is treated soybean meal, not roasted soybeans. That would be a little different picture there. Treat, uh, we're talking such things as lignosulfate treated soybean meal, heat treated soybean meal, things like that. You can see on milk yield there was no negative, that's good, but look at that. Out of the 15 studies listed up there, and each of those is a different study, 12 of them had no effect on milk yield. So you look at that and you say maybe this is not as good a winner as we thought it would be, but there was three studies that showed a significant increase in milk yield. We come across on soybean meal, again, you can see that surprisingly, five of the 15 studies, we saw a decrease in milk fat percentage and no study showing an increase in milk protein. If you go over to milk fat, you can see very neutral, really didn't do much of anything, and that probably makes sense. There's no oil in there. It is just a protein supplement. It was very neutral on milk fat. So this is a very busy slide. I'm not going to spend minutes and minutes walking you through each line. This is one you may want to print out and study a little bit closer, but you can see that each of these protein byproducts have a little different profile. If you want to look at the winner, I guess we go down to the bottom one on fish meal. You can see there that we have of the uh, studies, and you can see well in excess of 100 studies listed here. 18 of those studies had an increase in milk yield. Eight of those 18 came from fish meal. So you can see that they perhaps had the best impact in terms on milk yield. If you look on milk protein, we had six of all the studies that increased milk protein. Interestingly, fish meal had five of those six listed there. And on the butterfat test, you can see that 19 dropped butterfat fat test. And again, you can see fish meal had 16 of it, so it brings that baggage with it. So as nutritionists or dairy farmer, you certainly want to be aware of what these things do to the performance and the components there in the program. If you're on a market in which you want milk fat because it has a high value, you might have a little different strategy with fish meal than when milk fat is very inexpensive. And we've seen here in this last year in Illinois, milk fat going all the way from 9 cents per point to as high as 22 cents per point. And that's the magic or the strategy you got to look at because you 
you may want to change which protein supplement to look at. So a fun table to look at. Uh, I won't walk you through the rest of them, but you can see the pluses and the minuses. And this is one that you really want to study when you say, yes, I want to feed meat and bone meal, or yes, I want to feed fish meal, or gee whiz, I'm going to go to Brewer's Grain. The research says this is what you may anticipate on your dairy farm. This is our last slide, again a very busy one, one you may want to print out again. Dr. Jimmy Clark put this slide together for us and literally pulled together in all in one spot kind of the recommended levels we're looking at or the ranges you may want to be in, how much bypass protein is being consumed by the cow when we feed that level. For example, if we take blood meal, let's walk across that one and I think the chart may maybe be a bit clearer if we walk it through. There are those same numbers we talked about earlier, how much protein is in there, what's the bypass characteristic of the protein. The recommended range is that basically we at Illinois are suggesting a half to one pound. Be aware that some cows will spot a half a pound to three quarters of a pound depending on how it's fed, if it's in a TMR, if it's in a top dress supplement program, how finicky they might be to the product. And so if we are feeding 0.87 pounds, that would represent about 9.7% of the total protein intake. And one of Dr. Clark's earlier modules, he mentioned to you that you need to have a fairly high level in the diet to impact the amino acid flow to the lower gut. And that has to be certainly in that 20 plus percent range. So you can see blood level fed at this modest level because of intake problems may not have quite as much impact as we could feed twice as much. So then you can come down to feather meal. Again, you can see the dynamics of it, the recommended level. Again, fairly conservative. In fact, there's some neat studies out of Nebraska suggesting that if you feed feather meal, you should balance it off with blood meal because it has a very poor amino acid profile. While it may be uh, feather cheap, as we would say, it is a very low quality protein and you've got to bring a superstar like blood meal along with it. So you may want to tuck that in the back of your mind. Uh, just don't feed feather meal to your cows. I think both you and your cows will be surprised. And you may want to keep that ratio of blood to feather at least 50-50. And again, you can see again what effects that have on dynamics. Now you can see that even though the feather is higher in protein, but because it's slightly lower in bypass, the impact in terms of percent of the total diet is about the same as blood meal. So because all these factors play against each other, that number on the right side really varies. And you can see we have them pretty much grouped into those around 10%, those around 15%, and then those that are probably going to be the big winners, which are the corn byproducts. You can walk through, I'll just mention the levels, meat and bone meal, that that two to two and a half pounds is a bunch. Uh, a lot of people will stay more in the one and a half pound range. So if you want to tweak that, you uh, can lower that if you wish. But certainly that is a high level. Dr. Clark has done some work here at Illinois that they have achieved even higher levels, but they do it very gradually and very strategically. For example, they can almost double these numbers and get away with it if you do it very gradually and get position the cow properly. You can then come down to a fish meal. You, again, you can see at the uh, 1.34 pound level, which is a pretty big number, by the way, you can see where, again, we got about that 15% of the total protein coming from that source. So again, we're getting that kind of that marginal area about having impact based on Dr. Clark's uh, research and curves. And then according to the two corn byproducts down there, you can see that they, they perhaps are the stronger of the two because we can feed a lot more of them. They lose, we, we lose that baggage on palatability and we can get more into these cows. Uh, but the bad news is you can see that the level of protein starts dropping, the bypass starts dropping. And of course, if we did this on lysine levels, it wouldn't be nearly as pretty because these corn byproducts are very low in lysine. So certainly you can see as a nutrition consultant, veterinarian, as a student, as a farmer, you, you really have to understand the impacts of level versus the characteristics in the feedstuffs and a few of these feeds carry baggage with them such as high oil content that is highly unsaturated you gotta make sure you position it properly so it's a fun module to talk about certainly byproduct protein uh, sources can be uh, an extremely good strategy in the farm but it's got to be done right it's got to be done carefully and really watch the dollar sign thanks and have a good day